Hello, welcome once again to Latell's Law. I'm Steve Latell. This is part three. Welcome to Crazy Town. I'm wearing the blue shirt. This is my Crazy Town shirt. Uh, and as you know, if you've watched the previous two episodes, I'm shooting these in real time, meaning I don't know when this is going to air. I don't plan on airing episode one until the last episode is shot because I want the story to have a complete arc and I want to know that it exists before I actually start putting up videos. I'd hate to start something and have it finish weirdly. So... Here's the deal. I told you in episodes one and two about how I'm being sued with a frivolous lawsuit in the state of Michigan, Wayne County Circuit Court, where a crazy person uh, went and got an attorney and talked the attorney into signing her name to pleadings, which state that I am somehow indebted to her client to the amount of possibly $600,000 for something I did which is perfectly legal, which is what attorneys do all the time. I sued her client seven or eight years ago, got a judgment against him, and when he didn't pay it on behalf of my client, I then got a writ of execution, handed it to a court officer, the court officer executed on it, and then got some money from the guy. And the guy sat on that for six or seven years, decided he was unhappy, and then he started making all kinds of crazy things, and he filed a lawsuit against me. And I mentioned before that, for instance, the guy had tried to fight this in the lower court, he'd lost, he'd burned through a whole bunch of attorneys down there, he also filed a claim with the attorney general's office in Lansing who shot him down and said, dude, you haven't got a case. And somehow he caught, he, you know, he convinced this one attorney to sign her name to this case. And I mentioned before that when an attorney signs a document in the state of Michigan and files it with the court, they're certifying that they've investigated it and they believe with a good faith basis that the underlying claims are good and the underlying law you've pled is good and that the case is actually a valid case to be making. And anybody who reads this complaint will look at it immediately and go, this is a pile of garbage. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, procedural things wrong with it, not the least of which is what the guy is claiming I did was perfectly legal. I, 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 I'm I an attorney. I sue people. If you could sue an attorney because he sued you and for no other reason, what would that do? But obviously, if an attorney does something wrong, like this attorney's done to me, she opens herself up for liability. But that's another story. We'll get to that in a later episode. So... Most recently, I told you, I got served with the lawsuit. I hired an attorney. My attorney's name is Ed. He's a great guy. I hired Ed. Ed had to file an answer to this pile of garbage. And by pile of garbage, and, and you know, I've been practicing off 28 years in the state of Michigan, substantially longer than the attorney who's suing me. <laughs> and the complaint she filed uh, is 56 pages in, in depth. And uh, along with the 56 pages are 36 counts most of which are just gibberish, uh, meaning that this stuff, a judge will look at this and throw this out. So just to update you, though, my attorney filed an answer, several other uh, defendants, because I'm not the only person being sued. Uh, this woman and her client are suing everybody. They're suing the court officers who executed the judgment. They're suing my client for suing them. <laughs> Follow that through to his logical conclusion. My client could now sue him for suing them. And then he could sue my client for suing him, for suing him, for su So the dog chasing his tail, whatever. Um, so I hired an attorney, Ed. Ed filed an answer to this pile of garbage. And the other defendants also had to hire attorneys. And many of them have filed answers also. So the file's already like this thick. And this case was simply filed, uh, you know, recently and was only served in late August. So here's, here's the thing. Here's the most recent update. So my attorney files an answer. A couple other attorneys file answers. And an attorney for one of the defendants, the defendant's a friend of mine, and her attorney's a friend of mine. And her attorney called my attorney. He's also a friend of mine. <laughs> We're all friends here. Can't we all get along? And my two friend attorneys are talking to each other. And we had a theory about bringing a motion for summary disposition to get the case thrown out, summary judgment, to get the case thrown out because it is lacking in so many ways that it this cannot survive and actually proceed to trial. That's just a joke. But the interesting thing is that the attorney for my friend pointed out there's a problem with this case. This case, and I mentioned this before, was originally filed in December of last year, but it wasn't served on me till the end of August of this year. So in other words, the lawsuit was filed here and eight months later, it's served. But if you look at a summons that comes with a complaint, the summons has on it a thing at the bottom that says issue date and expiration date. 
And in most cases, a summons is good for 91 days. And it says right on here, it goes, this summons is invalid unless served on or before its expiration date. And so if you have an original summons with a complaint and it's 91 days from the entry of the summons, the summons gets entered when the case gets filed. The case was filed last year. 91 days into this year would be the end of March, possibly early April, but it looks like it was issued a few days into December. So let's just say the uh, January, February, March, end of March. So what happened between March and August that allowed them to serve me and the other defendants with a case whose summonses had expired five months ago? And the funny thing is, like I said, I don't do defense work generally. So it's one of the reasons I hired a defense attorney. I wanted somebody who thinks like that. And so my attorney and the other attorney were talking about it. I said, you know, that's, <laughs> that's an interesting question. So they went and dug through the file at the court and they found that the original summonses had indeed expired. They'd expired because they hadn't bothered to serve anybody. And by the way, I'm not hard to serve. My office is just a couple of miles from the plaintiff's attorney's office. And I have an office that's all over the internet. If you, you know, the address, if you, if you want to find me, um, I'll, I'll tell you right now a scary proposition. Google Steve Leto pictures and see what pops up. You will find thousands of pictures of me. I'm, I'm sorry that I did that the internet. <laughs> but type in Steve Leto office address and you'll find my address in about two seconds. So the attorney who filed this complaint last year didn't bother trying to serve me until five months after the initial summonses had expired. So one of the weird things about this is when the process server served me with the complaint, the first time he tried to show up at my office, you know, I, I, I got it from him. And um, I said, hey, wait, this thing was filed in December. And he goes, oh, you're kidding me. Because that doesn't seem right. That's her guy saying that. That doesn't seem right. I said, no, it doesn't, does it? So anyways, it turns out under Michigan court rules, if you uh, file a lawsuit and get a summons issued, the, the summons has 91 days and then it expires. And once it expires, it's done and um, there is a process by which you can extend a summons before it expires. But you cannot extend one after it expires because the moment it expires, it's dead. And it's like anything else. I'm sure you know there's many things in this life that you can keep extending as long as they're alive. But once they die, they're dead. You know. So the interesting thing is that this attorney apparently had gone into court and said, Oh, your honor, my uh, summonses have expired. Can I have new ones? And the judge said, oh, sure, I guess so. And the judge issued some new summonses, which you're not allowed to do under the Michigan court rules or the revised Judicature Act, the RJA, which governs how our courts operate. Why the judge did that, I don't know. But of course, it was an unopposed motion, meaning that somebody comes into court and says, hey, my opponents aren't here. I must get to win this. Well, the reason her opponents weren't there is that none of her opponents knew that this case existed. I didn't know there's a lawsuit out there. I was being sued for eight months without knowing it. That's the craziness of all of this. So to update you where we are today, um, my attorney calls me the other day and he says, hey, Steve, we got a bit of a, a, a activity in your file. And I go, what's that? And he goes, well, the attorney for the plaintiff has called and asked me if I'll stipulate to let her get out of the case. And I go, what do you, <laughs> what? And he goes, yeah, she wants out. Now, I've already told you two episodes back that I'm planning on filing a, a professional action against her with the Attorney Grievance Commission because she filed a piece of garbage and signed her name to it. She knows that. And so the fact of the matter is that she signed the complaint, sat on it for eight months. Then she got this renewed summons, which you're not allowed to get. And then she served me with this complaint. And then the second I file a motion to dismiss based on the bad summons, and the other attorney does also, she then immediately says, oh, by the way, I want out of this case. Are you guys cool with that? And the funny thing about this is that's not how you get out of a case. The way you get out of a case is you simply tell your attorney, excuse me, you tell your client, you need to get another attorney. And once your client gets another attorney, you file what's called a substitution of counsel. Anybody can substitute in as long as it's not being done in a way that's going to delay the case or something. But it's generally granted, especially this early in a case, because although this case is eight months old, I was only recently served with this. It's a young case as far as that goes. So if, if her client can get another attorney, substituting somebody in is no big deal. Apparently, though, she wants out and her 
client can't find another attorney. Surprise, surprise. But now that she's signed her name to this sinking ship, she's tied to it unless she can get someone else to agree to come aboard and take over. And she can't, apparently. So what's funny is she actually got her client to sign a document saying, I agree to let my attorney out, and she submitted that to the court, which, again, is not how you do it. And the court kicked it back and said, no, we don't do it this way, and sent it back to her. So the upshot of all of this is that I was served with the complaint back in August, okay? And we had a hearing date set for November 7th to actually have the motion for summary disposition heard. And that got adjourned to November 13th, which kind of bummed me out because I can't be there. I've got someplace else to be on the 13th. And so I, I, I called up Ed and I said, Ed, I, I hope that she's not going to use this inability to get a substitution of counsel in as, as a way to delay the case. Because this is annoying me that I got served in August, September, October, November. And here we are, we'll be halfway through November. I got to have three or four months of this nonsense in my life. It's bothering me. It's wasting my money and my time. And right now my time is more valuable than money. And uh, he said, well, here's the funny thing. She did set, you know, she asked the court for a hearing date on her motion to withdraw. And he goes, the judge set that for a later date. <laughs> Meaning she's got to show up on the 13th and defend this monstrosity. And if it gets dismissed, then her motion to withdraw becomes a moot point because there's nothing to represent. And, of course, if the judge denies their motion or takes it under advisement or anything like that, well, then she can go back to court and argue about why she wants to withdraw and why her client get, can't get another attorney. But anybody who reads this legal atrocity, the 56-page, 36-count complaint that includes language such as the writ ripoff, and the bailiff bamboozle will go, oh, <laughs> no wonder you can't get another attorney to handle that case. And, and just, just so you understand, uh, you know, like you might say, Steve, but you're biased. Of course I'm biased. Everyone's biased. But, but you say, Steve, you're biased. Obviously, you think this is a frivolous lawsuit because you're being sued. Well, here's my point. She alleges that I owe her client $600,000. And she alleges that that's joint and several liability with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different defendants, okay? So generally speaking, if you go to a plaintiff's attorney and say, hey, do you want a $600,000 case against six defendants, several of whom appear to be collectible? Do you want that case? They'll jump on that, like I say, as if it's a loose ball in the end zone. But... No one's jumping on this case. People are jumping off it. And in case you're curious about that saying about rats getting off a sinking ship, I know people often say that no one ever stops to think about it, but it's actually true. If you have an old boat, old wooden boat, you know, like a galleon, okay, a pirate ship, that kind of thing, and you're out at sea, there are rats on board. Rats get everywhere. And rats often live down below deck, and they sneak around at night and so on, but they often live way down below deck. So if a boat starts to sink, they're the first to know, especially if the water's coming in and working its way up. So what happens is, of course, the rats, when they wake up and they're going underwater, their first thought is, oh, go to high ground. So they start heading up because the ship is sinking, but they're not thinking the ship is sinking. They're going, hey, look, it's getting wet down here. So as they head up, they then start encountering humans who are often running around like chickens with no heads because of the fact that the ship is sinking. The humans often know this. Someone starts to yell, hey, the ship is sinking. So what happens is, as the rats and the people are interacting, the rats go, well, we don't want to go down below where we'll drown. And we can't stay here where these people are running around like crazy. So they just keep heading up, because that's natural instinct. When they get on the deck where all the activity is, many of them do wind up going overboard. So rats jumping off a sinking ship <laughs> is actually something that some rats do in the right circumstances. So this, my friends, again, my prediction to you, 56 pages, 36 counts, filed in the Wayne County Circuit Court, and the one attorney who the guy talked into signing it is bailing out of it like it's a sinking ship. And no one else wants to get on board. 
Makes you wonder why. So that, my friends, is going to wrap up episode three. Welcome to Crazy Town. Like I said, these will go up when the whole thing's over. Hopefully sooner rather than later. Questions or comments, please place them below. Otherwise, talk to you later. Bye-bye.